In this video, on that messy board, I explain what the benefits of being a principal investigator are. Hey Guru Nation, welcome back to the clinicaltrialsguru.com. Thank you very much for watching. Make sure you subscribe, hit that subscribe button. YouTube's got that bell now if you're watching on YouTube. Hit that bell, all right? Turn your notifications on when I go live when I do a new video to get my notifications when I go live. Okay, so today's question comes from someone who texted me. Very simple, anyone can do it. It's 949-415-6256. What are the benefits of being a principal investigator? First of all, we gotta differentiate what are the different kinds of research. And for the purposes of this video, it's academic research and then it's industry-sponsored research, okay? Very different benefits on each side. I don't know much about the academic side. I've done a little bit of marketing work for them. The benefits of academic research, so let me write that down. The, the first type of research that a PI could consider is academic research. This is when you are a physician, you work for a hospital or a university or a university hospital. Your school or the university gets grants, typically from the NIH and then uh, you create the protocol, you sometimes partner with a pharma company or another drug company like a biotech sometimes and you share publishing rights. Okay, so for these ones you get publishing rights. Also, academic research tends to be just a little more prestigious. You're not necessarily doing it for the money. Okay, you're getting a grant, you've got to use that grant, um, but you can pretty much, as long as the whoever is co-sponsoring the study with you, um, they're going to let you know, you know what your limitations are as far as what you can experiment with. And then every institution has an IRB, um, but we don't want to get too complicated. So publishing rights is one. Also prestige. A lot of prestige is associated with conducting academic research and also private funded research. Okay. So And this is how you get tenured at a university. Okay, You do research, then you're a professor and the two sort of feed into each other. I don't know much about academic research other than what I just mentioned. The next kind, the kind I do know a lot about, is the industry sponsored trials. And this is where 85% of you potential PIs watching are going to fall into. So unlike academic research, industry sponsored is really, I mean, you can say it's about prestige. You don't get any publishing rights in industry sponsored, okay, no publishing. Uh, zero. Okay, I have yet to see a contract where they give the PI publishing rights after the study's done. Just you can't do it. Um, also, in the academic studies, you have more control over the protocol, obviously, because you're helping to create it. Here, you're given the protocol in the industry sponsored trials. You're given the protocol by the drug company. You have absolutely no say in it whatsoever, other than some feedback they might ask you. Um, at your site selection visit, which they may or may not take back to the sponsor. They have their protocol. They just want you, the PI, to enroll patients in the study, to maintain uh, quality of data, to follow good clinical practice standards, um, and to ensure the safety of your study participants, which is also part of good clinical practice. So that's what they want from you. Okay, But 85% of research, 85% of research, and now more because Trump just slashed 20% of the National Institute of Health Research budget. So it's going to take away even more research from academic into the industry sponsored side. So you're going to see, I'm predicting, again, I'm not a prognosticator, but it's just supply and demand. So I'm going to, you're, I'm predicting you're going to start seeing a lot of academic PIs switching over to the industry sponsored PIs. And in the industry sponsored, it's really, again, it's about prestige. I mean, most doctors still don't do research. In fact, I don't know what the stats are, but I think only 15% or 10% of, of physicians have ever participated in a clinical trial as a PI. Um, and then an even more alarming stat, 90% of PIs who do their first study never do a second one. And that's unfortunate because that's how we help raise awareness of clinical trials to the general public because patients trust their physicians and if their physician is also a principal investigator of a study 
they're much more likely to want to join that study because the physician has a lot of influence over the patients. They've established a rapport. Okay, so in the industry-sponsored trials, it's really about the money. It's about, so we negotiate contracts and budgets for PIs, for new PIs, for new sites all the time. You're given a budget, however, and a contract. Uh, however, most research-naive physicians, they don't know that you can negotiate the budget. So that's the first uh, step, is to actually negotiate your budget. And you can negotiate sometimes triple what the original offer is. Okay, This is just a for-profit. There's no grant here. You're not getting federal funding from anywhere. It's You get paid when you randomize subjects. Okay. Now, why do physicians do research? Some want to be on the cutting edge of new treatments and technologies. Certainly the case for many. Uh, others do it to supplement some of their income and to add an additional revenue stream to their private practice. So many, many private principal investigators have a private practice. This is where they treat their patients. They bill Medicare, they bill private insurances. Some, some bill the patient's cash. And then some of the patients can qualify for some of the studies that the PI has. Okay? And you, you might want to keep, you might want to consider keeping, even though you're, they're most likely your private practice and your research site are going to be in the same office, your own medical practice, uh, you might want to keep them as separate entities. So if you have an S Corp or an LLC for your private practice, you want to do the same thing for your research clinic. They could operate under the same roof. You're the PI. You can own both of them. There's nothing against a, a physician owning a research clinic. Like There's no conflicts of interest. It's, it's done all the time. In fact, we need more to do this. We need to raise the general awareness. We need to increase trial participation without spending millions of dollars doing it because this is why we're paying so much for our medications. Right? So we need more doctors involved. You funnel some of your patients from your private practice into the studies when appropriate. Obviously, the bigger your private practice, the bigger your research clinic can get. Then you're going to have study coordinators. Okay. And this is, this is another benefit of being a PI. Yes, you are responsible for the conduct of the trial. Yes, you're going to be reminded of this at every single occasion from every monitor you ever will meet. That doesn't mean that you're doing 100% of the work. You're delegating most of the work to your research staff, who, by the way, you're responsible for training. What many research naive physicians do is they hire someone like me to come in train their staff, train the PI themselves on how to do research, and then they implement, and we create, and then they implement the training system at their site. And then any new hires get trained by the PI because now the PI understands how to, how to run a research study and how to follow GCP. So 90% of the work is being done by the study coordinator. The PI needs to have oversight, but you're making about $1,000 per patient visit. And many of these studies have, on average, 10 visits, and you're generally contracted 10 patients. And again, I cannot write left-handed. Again, this is just very much ballpark, but if you're given 10 visits per patient, per study, and you can enroll 10 patients per study, provided that all 10 patients finish, all 10 visits, you make $100,000 in a year gross from one study, okay, just one. Most new sites get three or four studies in their first year, and then they get maybe six to eight studies in their second year, and then they can either continue at that pace or they can grow. Okay, so you can see in your second year, if you're doing six to eight studies, you're making, let's say, 600,000 a year, you're paying a coordinator maybe anywhere from fifty to seventy-five thousand dollars a year salary. They're doing most of the work. They might have assistants that you're paying like fifteen bucks an hour, like medical assistants to draw blood, or they may not. Maybe the study coordinator does it all. Uh, as long as you're funneling the patients into your studies, 
you're already getting paid for treating your patients from your private practice, but now this is an additional revenue stream. It could be up to 800K. You can make a million dollars gross, all right, if you get some inpatient studies going or if you just have more than 10 outpatient studies going on. And, like, that's a lot of money. I mean, I know in big private practices, I work with a lot of psychiatrists, and the big private practices here in the LA area, uh, the average doctor in a big practice that's pretty high up there, like almost a partner, or a partner, makes anywhere from 400 to 800K a year. The physicians who are not quite partners, who work underneath the partners, they might make like two to 400K a year. If you're one of those guys, you're, you, you, and you continue doing that, and you hire a study coordinator, and you pay them $50,000 a year, and you hire someone like me, and pay me $1,000 a month to get you studies, to sort of uh, pour some gasoline on the fire when you get started, I mean, you're making another $800,000 a year, if you have eight studies, of which you probably keep, let's say, 500000 and that's being excessive with the costs, like petty cash, marketing, uh, hiring a biz dev person like myself, hiring a coordinator, maybe even paying yourself private practice some rent. Because remember, your research clinic is a separate entity, so they should be paying rent, but that's going back to you, especially if you subcontract, or if you own the building, it's going in your pocket. If you lease the building, you can subcontract it out to your own research clinic, money back in your pocket. Right, so this is why there are many benefits to doing uh, research as a PI. And from the private industry sponsored trials, it's clear, well, I don't know if it's so clear anymore, but it, it's clear when you understand the full picture that you're adding another revenue stream, but you're leveraging other people's efforts. By the way, each coordinator can handle about four studies on their own. So if you're getting 10 studies, you need two and a half, maybe three study coordinators. Let's say you're paying them all on the high end $70,000 a year, which you won't. Uh, you're going to pay most likely one on the high end and the other two on the average. So you're paying $210,000 in salary, which is going to be your biggest expense. So from a million dollars, you're seeing just under eight hundred k minus any rent, petty cash, supplies, which many of the supplies you're already going to have, like blood pressure cuffs, weighing scales. You're going to need to get a centrifuge and all that stuff. So you can see that for 90% 90, 90 of the work, you do have to maintain PI oversight. But most of the work is delegated to your study coordinators. Just like in your private practice, so much is delegated to medical assistants, front desk staff. Um, I know front desk staff that process refill requests all day long. Like You're seeing patients. And in research study, you're meeting with monitors and you're making sure that the patients are safe during the trial, during their participation in the trial, and that you're reporting adverse events and serious adverse events, and that you're looking out for the best interests of the patients. But other than that, which is really what you should be focusing on, your study coordinator is gonna take care of the rest, if they're good, all right? The problem is some PIs don't even know they need a study coordinator, or they end up bringing one of their front desk staff in to be a study coordinator, and then no one's training them well, and then they make mistakes, and then monitors get on the PI about it, and then the PI decides it's not worth their time because they could be making more money in their private practice, and then they, they stop doing research, which happens 90% of the time. So don't let that be you. Implement your hybrid research site model, and um, that's the benefits of being a principal investigator. Thank you very much, Guru Nation, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.